Owen, thank you so much. Um, I think I'm going to have the pleasure of journeying back to uh, semi-suburban southeast London with Owen this evening, possibly passing Battersea Power Station as we go. So rather than ask the first question of him myself, I really just want to be a conduit for any questions coming from the audience, which I'm sure there will be many and varied. So uh, we're a little bit um, longer on time, but uh, we, have a, we have a few uh, opportunities for questions. So um, would anyone like to ask the first one? Uh, it's Peter, the author of the new book on Battersea Power Station. How appropriate is that? The, the question that I sort of came up a lot when I was writing my book was, was what should happen to Battersea Power Station? Mm. And I asked it of a lot of people I interviewed, and it's what I'd like to ask of you. What, what should have happened with this space? Um, the only proposal that, I, that, that I've come across, and I'm, and I'm not an expert on this, and you are, so you can come back to me on this, but um, is, and this is not an architect I like, so I hate to have to praise him for something, is Terry Farrell. I think that his proposal to just have it as a, to secure it and have it as a ruin in the park is the only thing that makes any sense, actually. Um, it doesn't really work for anything else, functionally. Mm. Um, you know, the various attempts to have, like, shopping malls and art galleries and, and you know, Chelsea and uh, just, just haven't worked, and they won't work. Um, and I think that's, that's, the only w that's the only way that could actually capture the thing that makes that building special um, without it being daft. Um, so I think that, actually... And they should have built social housing on the on the area around. There's a nice line in Alice's film about we weren't allowed to just crumble and decay. And there's something about, I think, the idea of not being allowed for things to just stay as they are and to stay still because everything has to be moved forward in some mm. way. And what I think we've seen in your talk is this perfect encapsulation of how you know, power generation turns into money generation. It's it's absolutely about what can you do with that site for it to for it to make enough money to sustain itself. I mean, itself. initially, of course, power generation was money generation. I mean, that's well, that, 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 you know, that's it's 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 not like it was it was built for like some kind of socialism. It wasn't, um, but it's just a, d a different version of, and I that's think it. probably a much more, in many ways, a, a more a more brutal version of the same thing. But the um, it had a long time as a ruin. It had a really long time as a ruin. I think much longer than buildings get to be ruins nowadays. Like mm -hmm. 35 years is a lot. The only thing I think that's comparable, and it's a bit further out from the centre, but almost sort of similar in scale but much less interesting building, is the Millennium Mills at the Royal Docks, if anyone knows it. And that, again, is this sort of enormous, great big thing that just sits there and rots surrounded with luxury flats and the XL Centre and other such horrors. Um, and so and they, that one hasn't gone yet. No. They, they keep proposing stuff for that. And it, it's, I think, even more difficult to work out what to put in that because it has things like 30-storey drops and just mad things, about 30-storey, about 20-storey drops. But there was community involvement back tw 29 years ago. I mean, there's one or two of us here who actually sat on committees that um, were grouped by uh, Wandsworth Council, and one of them was the Employment and Training Steering Committee, but the other one was the Community Space. I mean, obviously, we used to take the piss. Which, which part are they going to hang us in so that we're not an embarrassment? How will they hide the community? Because we were very aware, some of us old cynics then, that um, the new administration Tory administration in Wandsworth was very much in co competition with Westminster um, being, you know, the radical Tory borough starting privatisation, but also in terms of redevelopment. Um, and they always knew that they were going to develop luxury type stuff all along the river there. From the very beginning, it was obviously, it was just a question of sitting back and waiting for, I think, the critical mass that probably came with the embassy and the various interests that were beginning, the Chinese money, all sorts of stuff like mm -hmm. that. And it eventually it was just going to be a question of the, the, the critical mass um, and the power station was just going to be uh, just another, but it was going to be one of the first mm -hmm. that was going to get developed. I, I, I think that's you know how, how uh, some of us saw it happening mm -hmm. here. Yeah, that makes sense. Another question. 
could be just like too much. Yeah, one of the films, things that the film, I think, emphasized a lot for me, you know, was how London, this part of London, I don't know, constant build, destroy, build, destroy, destroy evolve, something goes, but something is gained. And, and, and what, what's happened in my lifetime, which, which kind of has taken me by surprise, is that the life expectancy of, say, a council estate like Wynne Stanley at 40 years is considered, it's now, it's now maxed out, it's time for it to go. So we look at this horrorscape here, but then bearing the film that we've seen, is it really going to last for more than 40 years? Um, Hopeful. You know, it, something else will replace it. That, that's, that the idea of permanency um, in London has, has, I think, gone. Whereas the bits of Battersea that remain that haven't been developed are lovingly 100, 150 years old or whatever. But anything that's been put off after the war is going to come down within a lifetime. That's what cheers me up slightly. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is something you see in Tokyo, for example, where there is a, a, a much more you know, extreme uh, transition and throughput of different buildings. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but what you don't get there, and what you do get with something like this, is that you have that combined of heritage, right? So you'll have you'll get a huge amount of overdevelopment, but it will, it will pull in some sort of trophy as a kind of like, but here is history, and that's quite new. Mm. That wouldn't, you know, 50 years ago that wouldn't have happened. Do you think it's worth keeping the power station chimneys even though they are not authentic? I mean, it, it, you, know, you wouldn't really go for a polystyrene Stonehenge, would you? And we know that these, these chimneys are, are not the chimneys. They mm. are just, you know, plastic replicas or whatever yeah. they're made of. I mean, I mean, that in itself isn't unusual. I mean, lots of historic things in Britain are not actually historic. Um, you know, Palace of Westminster was bombed. What you see there is not entirely the building of the 1830s. Um, so that in itself isn't entirely a bad thing, although, like lots of things, the Battersea Power Station is a bit silly. There's a kind of like, why would you go to such trouble to rebuild non-functional chimneys with nothing coming out of them? Um, the thing that I find odd about it is that they seem a different colour, uh, as far as I can see. They're sort of a much cheaper looking concrete, but anyway, we'll see. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm not familiar with your work, but um, so correct me if I'm wrong, um, but there seems to be like um, an anti-kind of gentrification and anti-development and maybe like a nostalgia for kind of a golden era of like social housing. And I'm wondering if you could expand upon how you think this might relate to the project of the left, like historically. I suppose one of the things that I was trying to stress a little bit in this is that in something like Churchill Gardens over the river, it wasn't even a project of the left. That was built by a conservative borough. Um, and so at that, that, that point you had a consensus um, between Labour and Tory parties that you um, would build public housing on public land, and that this was just accepted. Um, and currently, you have a consensus across Labour and Tory that you demolish those things and you build luxury flats on them, in order to, you know, uh, the only uh, the b both are justified as being for people's own good. But you know, I think that that, that actually um, now, that obviously is part of the project to the left in so far as it comes from decades and decades of lobbying and decades and decades of ideas and, you know, and the decisive victory of the Labour Party in 1945 election and so forth is how you end up having that. But it's not as left-wing as people always necessarily think it is. Um, I think it's more kind of... Um, you can see it in all sorts of ways. I think it was an enormous social gain um, and I think its, it's, it's loss is, 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 is a tragedy. But um, it's something that was also done in order to forestall, um, you know, uh, what was considered to be the risk of, of people choosing something more radical. I mean, there's no coincidence that this stuff stops at the point when the Soviet Union collapses, right? That, you know, that as soon as there's no longer a threat, an external threat, this stuff is, is, is no longer needed. But I could 
We could talk about this for a really long time, and it would be decreasingly relevant to Battersea the more I talked about it. I'm Keith Connor. I'm a, I'm a member of Battersea Power Station Community Group, and we were one of the, the campaigners who tried to get a different future for the for the building over the years. Um, just in response to the thing about Terry Farrell's um, scheme that you, you admire, um, I think there's two two things. One was the decision to list the building, which is probably a, a good decision, and there was the question of, of, of the separate decision to privatise it and to sell it off. And in fact, all the all the problems really that you sort of got to go into are, are, are really that second decision of CGB selling it and having that quick bad competition. Because if you think about, if you just look at the timeline from the mid 80s when it was sold to the mid 90s when the, the lottery came along, <laughs> it wasn't actually, you know, from our perspective now that long. And so I think if somehow those two things could have been connected, you know, not, not privatising it and, and putting a scheme together funded by the lottery, you actually probably could have had something quite interesting, some new, some, you know, in a way that is comparable with Tate Modern. And I think there, there probably were possibilities uh, for, for some new public facility or new interesting institution to, 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 to be there, rather than you know, perhaps alongside some kind of dereliction, but I think there, there were other possibilities. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know a huge amount about the proposals that were made by the community groups in the 80s and 90s, and I'd like to know a lot more than I, than I do, but I suspect they were more interesting than Raphael Vinoli. Hi. Um, as, do you know of, of any cases where um, an industrial area has become, or a brownfield has become obsolete, and it's been sort of given back to the natural world? Maybe even made a wetland centre or something like that. Has there ever been a case where, uh, you know, that that that's happened that you that you know of? Um, yeah, there has. There's been a few. Um, one of the examples that people always use, um, as as kind of the opposite to the British approach to, to these things, is um, the redevelopment of the factories of the Ruhrgebiet in Western Germany, um, where various parts of it had sort of educational buildings and, and, and st you know, the usual things like the startups and whatnot, um, could have put in them, but also a huge amount of it was just left to become derelict. The stuff that was, um, you know, that couldn't have anything new put in it was just, you know, it was allowed to become a kind of large continuous park. Um, and apart from the, the buildings being secured and stopped from falling down, that was all really that was done with them. Um, and it's it's an approach that is completely anathema to to what's happening to something like Battersea, where the whole idea is to make it look shiny again, you know, to have like a purple sky and and some shiny new chimneys and just a, and, and a glass roof, and just encourage it to look spick and span. But there are other examples actually. I mean, that's the one that comes to mind because it's a really really big project. Um, but. There is, there are examples of this. Currently, what's happening at the, although it's not an industrial building, what's happening at the derelict St. Peter's Seminary in Cardross outside Glasgow is a similar thing of trying to use it as a college while keeping it to some degree as a ruin um, and valuing it as that. Because this is, in many ways it sounds silly, but it's something that's completely routine in historic buildings. No one says when you want to restore a ruined, a ruined abbey of like, well, you know, you sure you don't want to put a shopping wall in there? Um, it's it doesn't doesn't come up. Um, so yeah, there are examples. I'm so pleased to be here because um, Owen and I have been on a platform before about art at, at Whitechapel G Gallery, and um, I remember it well. Yes, <laughs> and uh, I Aileen and I used to live just across the road, on the corner of Battersea Church Road, so it's marvellous to be in this building which I would have seen when I was at the Royal College of Art uh, in Kensington. So as an old alumni, I'm so pleased to be here. But I think what I wanted to say was, um, it's not just about this particular part of the river. The whole of the river Thames is uh, just being built in luxury flats. Um, and if you go to Wandsworth Bridge, there's a horrendous development there which is full of just close uh, glass and steel structures. And the only place that there is a small 
uh, estate is the Morgan Crucible Works, which is mentioned in the film. And I spent 10 years of that, my life, trying to get something decent there for local people. So it's a low-rise uh, project, uh, overshadowed by Richard Rogers, uh, um, well, it's just across the road, uh, uh, Richard Rogers' uh, uh, Mountain of Glass, Monte Vetro. And um, uh, so it's not just about th this part of the river, and it's not just about uh, rich people from this country. Most of what our research is that, uh, oh, I'm also chairman of Batsy Power Station Community Group. And uh, most of our research points to the fact that these are foreign investors. So a lot of Malaysians are bought on the Battersea Power Station site because it's being developed by Malaysians. The Chinese are building one at uh, the Bond Waste Centre down where, which is so ironic, where, you know, homeless people uh, drink in the street, you know, and, and uh, they, Versace is doing all the interiors for that building. It's on a, it's on a kind of a Victorian, uh, Victorian uh, warehouse, which is now being used as a uh, storage area. So you know, just to watch this go on all the way down the river from Putney, not just in Battersea, and with Battersea, of course. They really wanted the power station to crumble, as it said in the film, and disappear, because the power station actually dominates that stretch of the river. It's, uh, it's just where it was built, you know. That's so all the luxury flats have to be behind it, or cheek by jowl with it. So really, they probably still want it to go. <coughs> so my question is. Uh, uh, do, do you think that you know the climate of uh, Chinese <coughs> economy going down and other countries' economies going down and uh, 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 not being enough billionaires in London to buy these places will actually mean that they end up as council estates? <laughs> yeah. Um, I know I, I, I know of a housing association in Glasgow that went around. Obviously, Glasgow's got a lot less luxury flats, but it does have a few. And I know of a housing association that went around looking at this Glasgow Harbour development uh, to work out if they could put social housing in it, and they found out it was below their minimum standards. <laughs> and you'll find a lot of that. <laughs> um, so, um, lots, lots, lots there. Um, with the, 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 the foreign investors, that's definitely true. Um, I was uh, very impressed with a, a state agent sign which I found going on a walk today outside of um, the bus station in Vauxhall um, that said as follows, uh, Wiltshire, Abu Dhabi, Singapore, Hong Kong, London. And I thought that's, that's probably it. I think that's, that's where the investment's coming from, including Wiltshire. Um, I think that lo lo lots of lo lots of what's happened is explained by you know um, as well as there being this foreign money coming in, there's also lots of it is that's the connection to that and a, a sort of property and finance part of the British economy that's existed for a very long time and out and is older than in, than industry in many ways. It was old corruption, as as, as William Coppett called it, and um, I just. A this isn't really an answer to the question, but this is like just an anecdote. Um, on a bit of a whim a few weeks ago, I took a, a, a Thames clipper from the embankment to where I live in Woolwich. Um, I noticed two things, um, one of which was that there were, I think, maybe one or two stretches of river that didn't have new flats on. I think Convoy's Wharf in Deptford, and um, a few bits of the city where there's like, you know, historic warehouses and whatnot. Um, apart from that, it was flat, new shiny flats the whole way. And also I noticed that it was, um, no one was there at, at Embankment, but at, at, at the city and at Canary Wharf, loads of people got on and uh, people were commuting. They were commuting to work. And it costs, it costs more than your usual oyster fare on the train, but you know, they can afford it. Um, 
and for, for six quid you can you can commute with the river as your as your conduit and you can just live like that and the, the boat has a bar and I was lo looking at this and it was just full of like city workers like with their bottles of beer um, you know as like the sun went down with these glass towers <coughs> on either side uh, it's a completely new and completely strange part of part of London and it even has it even seems to have like its own means of transport and I'd never really seen it like that that actually you could you didn't even have to like get the tube of everyone else that you could actually just get get the boat to Canary Wharf or get the boat to Blackfriars and then like you didn't have to rub shoulders with Thames the rest Riviera of us Thames, Thames Riviera. yeah and I think that's that very much what it is and a lot of it doesn't even go that far in land so you would certain certain places like just loads of people would get off because it made more sense to do that than taking the tube like at North Greenwich about like 50 people got off and I was like now it all makes sense I, d I really enjoyed it but I do have reservations about architects and the work that they do I've recently seen a film called High Rise and all an architect managed to do in that massive tower block was create a dystopian group of people who really did live very, very bad lives. There is a lovely flat in, Ch uh, in Churchill Gardens, a ninth floor flat with a wraparound balcony bar one side, three, three sides wraparound, completely covered in greenery, flowers, loveliness, little tables and chairs to sit at every corner where there's a different view all over London and the person inside has reconfigured it so that it looks like a very small interior of a Regency house albeit in a one bedroomed single floor flat. A hundred yards away just over Chelsea Bridge there are loads of much newer much more expensive this was, was 180 18 years ago the ones on the other side of the river have balconies behind where you, you go past on the main road. And in another building, right opposite, you could le each lean over the balcony and were you friends, you could shake hands. If you were enemies, you could leap across if your neighbour left the window open and just rob them daft. Those people seem to me not to have access to light certainly fresh air because they, they consume one another those buildings and I want to know what the responsibilities of architects should be to the whole issue of light outside space inside good space fresh air and would you live in one of those yourself I would live in the Churchill Gardens one like a shot if it was offered to me and I'll bet you would too but I would not accept one of those that I can see hidden away behind that main drag that people are buying for phenomenal amounts of money. I think architects have got a responsibility to say, no, we're not building any more of those, and we're not going to build little side doors for the poor whilst we build massive facades for the rich to walk into. How do you feel about an architect <laughs> working as the way that you do, <laughs> in the way that you do, and what are your sort of aesthetics your aspirations for all architects to be good architects and ethical and moral. I'm not an architect, so um, I <laughs> have similar reservations about the profession and what they do. Um, if I were an architect, this would be how I earn my living, so it would be a very different matter. Um, and they, I, I know a lot of architects, and you know, you get lots of people who have this kind of, particularly if you get them drunk enough, will do this kind of, oh my God, let me tell you about what I'm doing. And then they'll tell you. Um, so they, they're well aware of how bad they are. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, they will have a proposal for something else that they'd like to do that they're not able to do. And quite often, they'll be able to do something else in a different country that would be a lot better. What it's really about is regulation. Um, I'm quite sure that Powell and Moyer, if they were like, you know, in a situation and uh, working in for Wandsworth Council now would be forced to build um, something like that rather than something like Churchill Gardens because that's the regulations. 
Um, now, there used to be regulations on flat sizes, on, on, on light, on open space, and so on, and they don't exist anymore. However, some of them have been brought back. And if you look at the more recent flats, um, some of the stuff in Nine Elms with the brick cladding on, for instance, but also if you go to places like King's Cross with the new stuff there, that tends to have much bigger balconies. It tends to have one door. Um, it tends to be have a bit more space, although not nearly as much as council estates used to, um, because of the London Mayor's Design Guide. And one of the things that I found quite strange in the last four years is that quite unusually, housing for the rich is now quite good. Like housing for the rich in the 90s and 2000s was terrible. It's much worse than council estates. Um, but the new stuff that's going up is actually, you know, like the current mandatory house sizes that have been used since, I think, 2012 um, are bigger than Parker Morris. So they're actually getting a good deal now. Owen touched on, on, on the river and, and its potential. I think the Thames is the biggest underused asset in London. It, it has such massive potential, and we use a tiny fraction of it in, in transport terms to enable people to get up and down. The quality of life in using the river is, is, is potentially massive. It is fast, it is efficient, and it is fun. It, why can't we use it more, f first point? Second point, it, and it was touched on earlier by the speaker down here, the construction, all the construction you see on that horrendous slide behind, it's, it's, it's not about local people at all. It's all driven by economic, e e economic regeneration and ultimately personal profit. Most of those tar blocks that you see built there would, have, would be 90% empty most of the time. You, you, you go in and you find a, port a janitor down at the bottom and 80%, 90% of the, of the flats empty with people coming in from time to time. That is a, 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 a problem London has because it is so economically driven. London 2012 has added to it, but it's been going on for the last 20 years. Now, per square foot, we, have, we are second only to Manhattan worldwide in, in the highest residential areas of London in terms of value. And, and we are perceived more and more as, as, as being the place to be. It, it is a, a lovely problem to have, but it is a huge problem for the culture of the capital. Yes, it is. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's part of the problem in yeah, industrial rivers are, uh, are, are for all sorts of reasons, not things that people like to, like rivers that are actually used tend to have a lot of noise and industry and stuff that you're not supposed to see. I, well, uh, you know, where, where, where I'm from, you have one of the biggest container ports in the country and there's one tiny little park about the, si that about the size of this room uh, where you can look at the water. Apart from that, the entire city is closed off because the fact the port's still industrial. So actually, in many ways, deindustrialization actually makes, as well as, you know, sort of, I guess you could say, sanitizes river, also means that it's something that can actually be used as, a p as public for the first time. Um, you couldn't have had the Thames Path and have had London as an, in uh, the Thames as an industrial river. It wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened. You'd have had interest that would have stopped it. Thi I mean, this uh, image here is extraordinary. I mean, it's... Um, hi, Brian. You can see him at the front there. Uh, Sally Laburn. I'm an artist with the Drawing Shed, and we were working last year on Cary Gardens, Patmore, and Savona Estates, which um, are across the road from Battersea Power Station. And when the developers met here, actually, to launch the cultural strategy, not once did those seven developers mention the existing residents of which there are thousands who live on those estates, which is exactly your your point about about how this. And you can see this; it's like a it's like a a wall going all the way along the river. And the question is, Owen, that we can't separate all this stuff going on with the new law that's just come in around, which turns every single social housing estate not just in London, but everywhere, into essentially a brownfield site, um, which is um, extraordinary and has kind of slipped through, um, regardless of protest. And there's been quite a lot of protest. Um, we can't separate those two things. And that movement of capital 
with the, you know, I'm sure that that 90% of properties being empty most of the time, um, that movement of capital will continue to move if it's not viable for that capital to be locked in the Battersea Power Station, it will, it will move somewhere else. So with all that and Boris's um, ability to loosen planning controls that were there, because this is th surely the only way that half of this stuff can be banged up so quickly without any real thinking going on, the thinking that we're starting to do now, what's actually going to be the, you know, the outcome? We're seeing um, cleansing going on of working class communities. Uh, I think the nearest I can get to being optimistic is that people now know it. And for a long time they didn't. If you look at what happened, I suppose, you know, a few miles to the east, but if you look at, like, the elephant, when, when the Haygate thing happened, there was very little opposition. There was opposition, but by and large, people believed the story. They really thought they were going to get nice new flats in the elephant. They really thought it was going to happen. Um, now they're starting on Yalesbury. No one thinks that. They've seen what's happened at the Haygate, and they're yeah. not, and, and they're really pissed off. Um, and I think you're seeing that all over London. I think people, you know, when like the media have noticed the fact that lots of the spike in membership and Labour Party via Jeremy Corbyn has come from London, they have this kind of like, ah, well, of course, it's coming from liberals in Islington who, you know, eat ciabatta and do other perverted things. Um, but I think that, that, that lots of that is probably the fact that people in London are really, really pissed off because, like, the city that they live in is being used as a sort of uh, a, a weird sort of offshore investment bank. Um, and, and people know this now. And, they d and this has been happening for a long time. This has been happening for 20 years. <coughs> but now people know it and they're annoyed and they're organizing against it. And on that level, I think that that's, you know, that, that will go somewhere. That, that, won't, that won't die down because it's only going to get worse. And I think people are actually now willing to actually oppose it. Well, before, I think they did believe in the, in the dream that they were being sold in the, in the 2000s in some way. And now they don't. You can't afford to live there and ask to oppose it, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, but it will take a long time. I mean, you know, look, look, look this is the thing. You can't afford to live there. Yeah. <coughs> but, at least, but these things take a long time. Like the whole Haygate thing, that took at least 10 years to get everyone out. Um, you know, simply on, on that level, you can rely on the ineptitude and corruption of, of property development, I think, that these things will take a while, long enough, I think, I hope, to stop some of them. I mean, this took 35 years. As, uh, as, as T. Dan Smith, who would know about these things, um, said, in capitalism, the worst corruptions are all legal. So. Um, that wasn't the final question. That wasn't the last <laughs> word. Um, the conversation will continue. The arguments will go on. The fight will, co will, will obviously go on, too. Um, I'd just like to wrap up the evening by thanking, uh, copiously and profusely, Owen Hatherley for a fantastic presentation and for a really uh, stimulating start to a great conversation. Afterwards, I'd like to thank Aura and Anne here for, as I said earlier, being such enthusiastic partners in setting up this event, to my colleagues at Film and Video Umbrella and to our collaborative partners at Jerwood Charitable Foundation. It has been a great evening, so thank you all very much for coming. Thank you so Thanks. much. Oh, and one more thing. Um, one more thing is that if you wanted to see Alice May Williams' Dream City more better sooner, one more time, it's on for another week at Jerwood Space. 
alongside uh, another outstanding film by Karen Kramer, also about a power station. So uh, uh, double your money, double your opportunity, but one more week to go. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you.